Welcome to Manful. Today, my guest is Han Fei Tu, who writes for Asia Times and is one of the most insightful analysts of China, China US relations, and the global economy. Han, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. In case you haven't figured it out, for the audience, Han Fei Tu is actually a famous sort of historical figure, a Chinese historical figure, and it's a pseudonym. And so we're not giving you the real name of our guest, but we are giving you his byline at Asia Times. And I encourage you to read his columns there. Han's background is in engineering in terms of his undergraduate education. He's had a storied career. Most of his recent work has been in finance. And at one time, he was a China equity analyst for a well-known investment bank. Is that accurate? That's perfect. Okay, great. So now we're actually having this interview in Beijing and you live in Beijing. In China in the early 2000s, you lived in Beijing. And then for some period of time, you were in Hong Kong and New York. And a couple of years ago, you came back to Beijing. Is that, was that right? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Okay. And so I thought we'd start by trying to give the listeners a little bit of a feel for what it's like to be in China or Beijing today in 2024. I think unless you've traveled to China recently, you can't really understand what the situation is today. And if you haven't been traveling here consistently for the last 120 years, it's tough to get a sense of how drastically things have improved here in China over the last, say, 20 or 30 years. So maybe we could start by discussing that. Yeah. So, so I moved back to Beijing in 2022, the end of 2022, right at the end of COVID, where I came out of quarantine, did my five days in quarantine, came out, and a week later, they opened everything up. So it was a very rough time to be moving back to Beijing, and it was just very stressful. And then in the back of my head, because I had lived in Beijing 99, 2001, it was just a very stressful city. It was you know, shoving and pushing it in line, people spat everywhere, the pollution, you know, just rudeness in public. And then when I came to Beijing, I was all prepared for that, steeled myself for that. And then suddenly it's like walking around the twilight zone where everybody is super nice. Everybody stands in line. Everybody in the subway is quiet, looking at their phone. The service is superb. When I go to the bank, when we had to set up all of our accounts, everybody was super helpful. Well, we had to register for the public security where I just expected, you know, dismissive officials. No, they bent over backwards to, to help us out. So it was just a very strange situation to be suddenly back in China and everything kind of changed. And it's one of these things that I've been here for the past three years to try to figure out, you know, why this has happened and whether it's replicable elsewhere. So I, just to drill down on that a little bit. So, okay, if you go back 20 years, like early 2000s or even 10 years, things were much rougher here. People were relatively poor. I mean, one of the aspects of having an eight or 10% per year GDP growth is if you go back 10 or 20 years, people could be three, four or five times poorer in the early period than they are now on average. and concomitant with that is that the, the situation, the life situation is rougher, right? As you said, like people didn't really know how to form neat lines. You know, if you go far enough back, there was much, they're much more likely to be spitting on the sidewalk. There's no such thing as customer service. All of those things are things which evolved quite a bit uh, into the present. Now, I was at last in Beijing in 2019, right before COVID. And I sort of already felt things were you know, improving a lot in Beijing. And if you went to kind of the nicer parts of Beijing, I already felt it was kind of approaching Tokyo in terms of the aesthetics of the architecture, how nice the space was. You could get a nice coffee and sit there and read some books at the bookstore. So I already felt we, it was already kind of coming along and it's just come even further now by uh, 2024. Does that, does that seem fair to you? Yes, that seems yeah, totally fair. And all this time, I'm racking my head on what exactly has, you know, quote, happened, what happened. 
And all I can come up with is it was just kind of a codition, very boring process. It's just as people get more affluent, the mindset of abundance replaces a mindset of scarcity. Yes. And the young people, especially who, you know, grew up in this environment and all of them pretty much, you know, 20 years ago, 5% of Chinese high school students went to college. Now it's approaching 70%. So it's, it's this much more highly educated. They don't have this feeling of scarcity where, whereas before, you know, uh, everybody rushed to the front of the line, afraid things will run out. That just, just, just doesn't happen anymore. Right. I, I think so. I, I tweeted an interview with, now I can't remember the author, but he's a pretty well-known American who lived in China and taught here originally in the nineties and then came back again. And he remarked in, on a lot of differences between the the, the students that he taught then and the students that he taught now. I mean, they're literally six inches taller on average and, you know, have more than one set of clothes to wear every day. And so just a completely different situation in terms of the level of affluence in the society. Now, in terms of living in Beijing, so this is a monster city, right? What's the actual official population of Beijing? Is it like 20 million people or something? Or it's like 26. I okay. My numbers. Yeah. So it's a, it's a mega city, but, and it has a really extensive metro system, but to ride from end to end, like if you start at one part of the city, you want to get to the other side on the metro, it could take you like an hour and a half or something to get across the city. It's so big. When you're getting from point A to point B here, I think many people would take the metro. On the other hand, you see a lot of locals riding city bikes, which they just scan with their phone and pay a couple of yuan and they're, they're on this little bike and they can pedal it around and then just leave it where they go. You see a lot of crazy looking e-bikes, which are totally silent and dangerous. Yes, so ele electric bikes. Yeah. So you've got all that going on. You've got a mix of totally silent electric vehicles very modern looking, crazy, futuristic looking ones. Then you've got more legacy internal combustion engine vehicles. So you got a mix of that going on. Traffic here tends to be pretty bad, but a typical, another way of getting around is to call Didi, which is like Uber. You just call it through your phone app. It comes and picks you up. The drivers here are kind of super efficient. You seem to get a DD like right away when you call it. And then, but you're, you're often in for a half, you, you know, to get from any two points, it's like, always like at least a half an hour because of all the traffic in the DD. So yeah. Similarly to DD yeah. is the way we eat now when we prepare food at home, it's delivered on the day. We never stop the fridge and the amount that you can spend for free delivery could be as little as, you know, 50 RMB, that's let's say seven bucks of yeah. food. Yeah. So basically our fridge is just entirely empty and whatever comes that day, week, right. So that's a kind of convenience that the city offers and most big cities in China now offer that kind of delivery service. Right. So I think that's something Westerners can't imagine like, you know, and that say, for example, my wife would complain about that like the level of convenience of life here in Beijing, if you're, you don't have to be super wealthy, but if you're just, you know, somewhat affluent here. You basically can have all your food delivered very quickly. You're surrounded by huge numbers of restaurants. Everything is super, super convenient. Now, in a way that's built on the backs of lots of delivery drivers. So you see a lot of people who are not making a lot of money and who are actually delivery people, Meituan or whatever it is. And they wear these sort of certain color uniforms and you see them on their bikes or whatever, electric bikes or whatever, delivering stuff. Um, in the hotel where I'm staying, there's a robot. And so when a delivery comes, like often it might be a food delivery, it might be something else. But when a delivery comes in, the, the hotel staff get it, they put it in the robot and the robot actually navigates up the elevator and brings it to your room. And when it gets near your room, it's like signaling, I think the intercom system or maybe your telephone. And then like, you know, the robot's there, you open the door and your stuff is delivered. If, you, if you've been in Beijing for a time, then you will run into the electric robot Meituan little vehicle. They're, 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 there's nobody inside. It's that stuff. It delivers things around to, I guess, checkpoints for then the delivery person to take the last mile. Right. So, so 
just in terms of like everyday use of robotics, and you, you might say like, oh, this is not super high-tech robotics, but in a way it is because it actually works, right? This city probably, or big cities in China, probably have reached a level of automation that you just don't find anywhere else. I don't know if you would find it in Seoul or Tokyo. So that's pretty striking. I think for, for, I think for people who are bilingual and can just fully function in Chinese, many of them would say the quality of life is actually, again, if you're somewhat on the affluent side, the quality of life here is just higher <laughs> than what you could get in the West. Is that, is that fair or am I exaggerating? That's, that's, that's absolutely fair. There, there are things you miss. There are things you miss. For example, there's more nature space. Yes. In the bust. But that, that is that is absolutely fair in terms of um, you don't spend so much time uh, going to Costco, stocking up for the week. Um, yeah. yeah, you don't do that here. Yeah, it's a lot of the things are just provided for you. A lot of the services are very cheap. Yeah. Um, but although we emphasize that automation is supporting that, there is still a kind of low income group that are doing the delivery correct. stuff. And yeah. so it is built on the backs of yeah. that. And yeah. it's like a, some of the most like kind of heart rending stories that you read about in China, especially because the economy is not so good right now, is like somebody went to college and maybe their family even maybe went into debt slightly for them to go to college, but now they're working as a Meituan delivery yes. person. So that like, you have to be fair and say like that exists. Like part of the convenience that Han here is experiencing <laughs> is built on some lower wage people that uh, are- yeah. To be fair, the, the Meituan people are not the very very low wage. They're, it's a grueling job, but if done efficiently, it's somewhat on the higher end of a blue collar wage. Okay. But still, you don't want to be a college grad in doing that. That was not your original intent. Right. Right. Now, in, in for me, talking to people here, and so the, the set of people I've talked to here um, so far on my trip, you know, a lot of university professors, scientists, graduate students, you know, the occasional driver or maid, everybody laughs at me when I say I talk to those people when I travel in China because it's become kind of a Tom Friedman um, cliche to do that. But I do find it actually useful. Um, I think almost everybody here says the economy is not good. Now, I've my model, mental model for this has been that it's mainly driven by the property bubble, the bust of the property bubble. Now in China, the financial markets, the equity markets are not that well developed. So most people who have money are investing it in like a second apartment or a third apartment, basically in real estate. And so you had a kind of bubble going where, especially in the tier one cities, people were, you know, over investing in a sense in real estate. And the government sort of saw this as a problem and realized it was a bubble. And, and again, historically, I've said this before, Many, some people realized this back in the US in 2008, and there was some discussion that, oh, should the Fed try to pop this real estate bubble that's building up, or should we just let it go and let nature take its course? In the US, we let nature take its course. In China, the government basically decided they were going to tighten credit and change some rules about investment in second and third apartments, and that has caused a collapse or significant decrease in property prices. I kind of think that's the main driver of the Malay, general malaise uh, that people he feel here. Because for example, if you look at trade surpluses, China has record $1 trillion a year trade surpluses with the rest of the world. So I don't think it's the manufacturing and export part of the economy that's underperforming. I think it's more this domestic internal uh, property and also infrastructure investment side. But I'm curious what, what you think about this, huh? Yes. So. If you just look at the numbers, then it's, that's definitely what's driving the lower GDP, as in the property sector, which, depending on who you ask, is around 20% of the GDP, and that has been falling. You know, one of the first uh, sectors that ever had a decline anywhere in China for decades, and the property sector, you know, the largest one, was going down about, you know, 4% a year. So because of that, the overall GDP was not running at 7 8%. Now it's running at 5 6%. Um, but what it says is that there are other parts of the GDP that is running at seven, eight percent. And, you know, we see it like in the, you know, the EV space, the solar power space, the batteries, those things are in places, you know, booming cities like Hefei or, you know, Dongguan, places that you don't really hear about. So 
there's a lot of malaise of urban Chinese people talking about how slow and how difficult things are. And yes, it's definitely happening, especially in the places where everybody goes to, Beijing, Shanghai. These places are, you know, kind of plateauing in the economy, while the real growth are in the second, third, or not, not even the second, the third, fourth tier cities. So a lot of the income growth is coming from there and not in, not in Beijing. So people here will not be happy if you talk about, you know, how the economy is going. Right. I think here you have multiple things going on. So for example, if you're on the affluent side and you own an apartment or more than one apartment, you realize, oh, the market value right now, that property is way lower than it was a couple of years ago. So that makes you worried. That makes you spend less money. Consequently, there's less consumption going on in these cities and the people whose livelihoods depend on that consumption, like people who run shops and things like this, they feel threatened, uh, economically insecure. And so there's this sort of potentially spiraling effect where um, overall the consumption level in the country is dropping and it's just uh, causing the economy to contract that part of the economy, which is distinct from you know some factory investing in huge numbers of robots to make super cheap solar panels uh, or batteries or whatever it is, and then exporting them all over the world. So, so you have one sector of the economy that I think is doing extremely well, and the government's specifically focused on growing sort of high quality growth in advanced manufacturing and high tech goods versus internal consumption in the economy, which you know is, 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 is definitely in the doldrums and maybe will require significant government stimulus to actually get people confident enough to to start spending again. Is that a fair description I, or I, my, I, what I, am I leaving out? I, yeah, I, I think yeah. I would kind of dis disagree that uh, domestic consumption is all that bad. Okay. Domestic consumption in a lot of, you know, foreign analysts, they think domestic consumption should take over as something that drives the economy. I think you have done the analysis wrong and that China's economy was never all that unbalanced. So I'm not all that worried if domestic consumption does not outgrow the overall economy. And last year, well, it, last year didn't quite count, but domestic consumption grew 7.8%, mostly recovery from COVID. This year, consumption, and, and this is taking not just retail sales, that's retail sales, a bit of a misleading number, but with the services involved, Domestic consumption this year is growing in line with GDP, about 5%. Okay. Uh, so I'm not too worried if it's just growing in line with GDP, because I okay. never thought the economy was unbalanced where there's too much investment and not enough consumption. That's never been my um, starting point. Okay. So here we're, we're, we're I think we're, we're slightly talking about two different things, because one is this issue of there's a characterization of the Chinese economy in which... Western economists who are used to a very consumption-dominated service economy think that China isn't like that, like the part of the total economy, which is made up by consumption, at least as it's measured, seems too low to these Western economists. And, and so there's a sort of macro discussion about this, quote, distortion in the Chinese economy. I, I, would, I just meant like as a secular thing because of the property bubble or whatever is causing the economy to kind of not be great right now. When I talk to average people, I think they're more conservative about spending money and there's a sort of knock on effect in the restaurants and stuff like that. I think that seems like it's true. At least a lot of people think it's true, but I think it's different from like this question of like, well, what is the actual overall, overall level of consumption in the Chinese economy mm -hmm. versus say a Western economy? And what is a desirable level for that to be at? So I, I think we're, we're, we were slightly discussing yeah, different yeah, things. Fair. Yeah, okay, that's fair. So, uh, yeah. but let's get into this question of the nature of the Chinese economy at a macro level. And like one of your earliest or maybe the first column that you wrote in Asia Times was about an economist named Michael Pettis. Who, am I right, Michael Pettis? Yeah, since he's not yeah. here to defend himself, I don't want to mention Michael Pettis' name. Oh, but, but I did. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> but, I, but I've read, so I've read a lot about Pettis and people often bring Pettis up to me. Like, so what, when people want to like argue with me on X or somewhere else, they'll sometimes bring up Peter Zahan. Who, oh, I love that guy. So I don't want to talk about yeah. that at all. And then like, sometimes people bring up Michael Pettis's analysis of the Chinese economy. Now, Michael Pettis is a guy with a background in finance 
I don't know if he has a PhD. I think he doesn't have a PhD. No, no. Okay. So he's a guy with a background in finance who is a professor at Tsinghua. So no, he it's a uh, Beida. Oh, Beida. Okay. Yeah. So he does live in China. He's a longtime China resident. He is a professor at a major university in China. So one should give him, you know, one should listen carefully to what he has to say. Now, I, I don't actually agree with his takes on this, but I did spend time looking into it. You've spent even more time. Yeah. So, okay, I realize you don't want to make this about Michael Pettis. But, <laughs> no, let's make it about him. But, but since fun. I brought in, so the, the, yeah. whatever blame there is for bringing him into the conversation, it's me. Mm -hmm. But I know you have an opinion about this. So maybe you could just talk about how, what, what he says about the Chinese economy and then why you disagree with it. Okay, so Michael Pettis has been in China writing about China for almost two decades now. And um, guess what? He has been writing the exact same thing on China for almost two decades now. And I have been following him for all this time, and we have even crossed paths professionally. I guess the biggest point is, as the years and decades went on, and he hasn't changed his view, and China kept growing far above his estimates, it's disturbing that he does not and had never have done a post-mortem on why things haven't worked out the way he has imagined. And he still sticks to the exact same story that it was 15 years ago, which is trying to invest too much and consume too little. Now, I believe I have done a post-mortem. Let me just pause there, because before we evaluate mm. the quality of his predictions, mm. I want to talk about his thesis. So, and this is, a, this is not just Pettis, okay? Mm. So like you could read this kind of take in The Economist, for example, yes. or even yeah. listen to, quote, yeah. real yeah. academic economists yeah. discussing this stuff. So there's a claim that China consumes too little in and invests too much. Correct. Now, related or maybe not related, service sector here is too small, right. too much concrete going into the ground, too much rebar, yeah. maybe building lots of capital intensive real estate or infrastructure projects that actually don't have a good ROI attached to them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so th those are all sort of parts of the story. Yes. And Pettis has been one of the major proponents of this view yes. that actually, oh, they got 8% growth, but they had to really struggle and the amount of money they had to expend to get people to build high-speed rail lines or skyscrapers or concrete roads in order to get that 8% growth number in GDP is unsustainable because it's super inefficient. So that, that that's, and if, if Pettis were right, it would be very dangerous because it would mean that China has to pour money into the ground basically to get its growth numbers. It's not high quality growth and it'll eventually have to collapse. It's not sustainable. And I took that seriously and investigated it myself. I didn't find his arguments convincing. Why don't you make your comment about it, Pan? Yeah, so all those, his framework is, I have nothing wrong with this framework. His framework is, you know, it makes sense. Now, the fact that it, nothing ever happened, nothing ever happened. China didn't have any kind of financial crisis. If you call this 5% growth a, you know, a crisis, which people are trying to say it is, then, well, I would love, many countries would love to have this kind of 5% growth crisis. So I did do some digging and then it comes out that, well, China supposedly is, you know, about 25% of the world's GDP, but only 13% of the world's consumption, if you go by the numbers. And supposedly China only consumes, its GDP consumption is only 38% of China's GDP compared to the U.S., which is almost 70. And Japan and Korea are in, you know, 50 to 55 range. Um, so China looks like it's way out of whack. And then, however... You know, luxury goods, China consumes 26% of the world's luxury goods. And then everybody kind of laughs and says Chinese people are, you know, suckered for luxury goods and, you know, have poor taste and the, you know, the wealth gap creates that. But then you look at every other consumption sector from cars to furniture to phones to electronics, China consumes well over 20%, some into 50%. So what's... Uh, of, the, of the total total world. world. Right. Pain of world. And then you kind of scratch your head and you look at China's retail sales. It's 6.9 billion, I think it was, for last year. China's retail sales is 6.9 billion, and that's a little bit higher than U.S. retail sales. However, the U.S. household consumption 
is something around, I think I'm going off my head here, around 15 to 17 billion trillion. So compared to their 6.5 trillion in retail sales. So most of US's household consumption is in rent, medical care, education, things that are not retail sales and services. China's household consumption turned out to be 6.8 trillion US dollars, less than what it reported in retail sales. Now that gets me scratching my head. What is going on here? Chinese people go on shopping sprees and neglect to pay rent and don't have medical care and don't send their kids to yeah. so let, me, let me recapitulate what you're saying. So there is a household consumption number from the US, yeah. but a big chunk of that number, like half-ish of that number. 150% more than retail. So yeah, 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 more than half. Yeah, yeah. Is, is not retail sales. Correct. Okay, but for the Chinese number, and this is more kind of a criticism of just the way the numbers are reported for China, yes. the, it looks like, quote, household consumption is more or less 100% or, you know, the, the, even there's a slight inequality there right. alongside, but uh, kind of like 100% retail sales. So all that other consumption is somehow not reported as household consumption for China, whereas it is reported as household consumption for the US. Exactly. Am I getting that right? Yeah, you're getting it exactly right. So, so the, the guy whose job it is to report household consumption in China is missing the rent payments, insurance payments, all the non-retail sales components that are reported in U.S. household consumption, but are not reported for Chinese household consumption. Yes, actually, we don't know exactly what they're reporting. I just know that when you add up all of their actual consumption of goods, China is, you know, it buys twice as many cars as the U.S., you know, three times as many phones. The food, you know, calorie-wise and protein-wise is has exceeded the U.S. The, the you know, appliances and, and Furniture is multiple times the U.S., and yet China has a much smaller retail, much smaller, like uh, about a quarter, or not not a quarter, a third of the U.S.'s retail sales. I'm not retail sales of U.S.'s household consumption. Yes. So something is missing here. So this something that's missing tells me that there, it's a it's a it's a reporting uh, issue. And if you look into the history of it, it's China from the very beginning. From the very beginning, they fought tooth and nail with the World Bank when they got onto the World Bank system, the United Nations system of national accounts, fought tooth and nail to report as little services as possible. That probably was part of their strategy of getting concessions for WT access, WTO ascension. But that has carried on through, through all these years that it is messing up and it has messed up the analysis of, you know, hundreds of Western economists. If you look at China's, you know, electricity production is twice the U.S. If you look at the production of cars, it's three times the U.S. If you look at all these actual things you can lay a finger on, China's economy is multiple times the U.S. But when it comes down to the actual reporting of the economy, a lot of it is just missing. Okay. So on... The specific thing we're talking about right now is household consumption. Yes. And so just to boil it down to something really simple, your argument is the way that household consumption is reported for China is undercounting by quite a bit. By quite a bit. So and, if I had to put a you know ballpark number on it, you know, US consumes like seventy percent of its GDP is his household consumption. China I would say about sixty. There's nothing unbalanced about okay. China's economy. Okay. And, and is is that the main part of Pettis's thesis that you disagree with, or are there other things There's as well? There's two parts. Okay. That is half of it. Okay. Uh, the other half is his thesis is that uh, China's export-driven policies is causing the U.S. to consume too much and deindustrializing the U.S. and it's the U.S. which has opened up its economy that it has you know, is forcing other and that other countries are forcing the U.S. to do certain things. When I think the causality, well, nobody knows the causality. Okay, this is a market. There are sellers 
and there are buyers. Okay. And this particular thing I don't disagree so much with Pettis about. So my view of this is that, remember that the exchange rate is a managed exchange rate. It's not, the market doesn't determine the dollar yuan exchange rate and the Chinese government really kind of sets it. And I believe they have set it in a mercantilist way. So they, the, 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 the RMB is undervalued against the dollar and that's so that Chinese companies will be successful in exporting. And so if you're an American company and you're competing, you might say, hey, these guys are flooding us with kind of artificially cheap goods because the exchange rate is depressed. And just to finish my right. thought, so, so, so I think there's some merit in that because if you do actual PPP or buying power comparisons, I actually, it, it looks to me like, well, the, so the World Bank does this and they conclude that the RMB is in a, in a sense undervalued by about 2X. And I also get that number when I just walk around here and I say like, well, how much food can I get? Or you know, how much did that cost here? And the exchange rate does make things artificially cheap if you're buying with dollars. And so that part of it, I don't completely disagree with Pettis. Like if you're a, a rising economy and you wanna make sure your export industries are able to grow and by growing they absorb technology and know-how from you know other com other countries who who have to come here and manufacture it does make sense to have a somewhat undervalued currency and then in a way that then sort of causes americans to buy more stuff since it's so cheap like the stuff they can get from china they have so much buying power they buy more than they otherwise would so to me like that part of pettis's argument is not completely crazy Th thoughts on that i don't think it's completely crazy i just don't think you can 100% assign blame to yeah. one side. Okay, I'm not. I think it's okay. a, it's a it's sort of a market as yes. in the U.S. has kind of almost backed itself itself into a corner, which is this is how the U.S. has been running its economy, so that people can ha have high living standards, is by having high highly paid service worker econ people like bankers and lawyers and consultants and marketing managers as opposed to factory workers and welders and machinists. And the way you have those high paying, highly compensated professions is you have this trade, trade of US yeah. assets right. for Chinese goods. So I, I, I'd put it this way. So, so since China does have a managed exchange rate, it's not FX traders you know, around the world and who are setting the dollar yuan exchange rate, the way it works with yen, for example, or or euro dollar, in a way there is a government which is setting that exchange rate and it's a Chinese government. Now, on the other hand, Americans have been pretty happy with this bargain. So what is the bargain? The bargain is dollar has a huge amount of buying power. US corporations set up shop in China to manufacture stuff, bring it back to the US. US consumers get tons and tons of, you know, originally cheap price and maybe cheap quality goods, but now increasingly cheap price, high quality goods. There's a, just a huge consumer surplus. I just always amazed at how much stuff I can buy now compared to back in like 1980 when I was a kid. We couldn't buy nearly as much stuff. Like you might get a new pair of shoes for your birthday or for Christmas and that was it. That was supposed to last you for a while. Whereas now you can just buy a pair of shoes off of Timu. It's like, I'll cost you almost zero. Mm. So there, there is something like that going on, but the US was kind of happy with it. And you know, the idea was, Americans could go into these really like high value add service things and we would let those Chinese guys manufacture all this stuff in these horrible factories and didn't seem like that's such a bad bargain. But now that China's caught up technologically, the US feels threatened by the overall size of the Chinese economy, the fact that they can't tell the Chinese what to do in terms of geopolitics. Now we're sort of alarmed by this setup and we want to we want to like reverse mm. some of what has been in place. Mm. Does that, does that seem reasonable to you? Yeah, that's perfectly reasonable. It's exactly what's happening. It's just that it's hard to... When, okay, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. I'll tell you a little story. When I was in grad school, and this is early 2000s, there's one professor, he taught the trainer class. Uh, and then we're talking about globalization. And his, he said, there'll be winners, there'll be losers in globalization. So what are we going to do with the losers? And he said something absolutely brilliant at that time. He said, pay them off. And then, well, what do you mean, pay them off? Well, the, the gain from globalization will be so great that the Ohio factory worker who loses a job, you know, well, we'll just pay him, or and then they'll be paid off from all the gains, and everybody will be better off. 
And then we all clapped our hands and then we're like, yeah, of course, that, that's, that's, that's so elegant. Except now 20, 25 years or 20 years later, we're scratching our heads and like, oh, there was never a mechanism to pay them off. What exactly were, what were you expecting to do? You know, give them welfare checks and, and, and food stamps or were we going to retrain them to be computer programmers? So that never quite happened. And what actually happened was all the gains from globalization were all hoarded by, by well, the shop troops of globalization, the bankers and the consultants yeah. and, so, and that class. So now we're in trying to reverse that trade. We're trying to reverse that trade. And I just hope that people will have a better, more well thought out plan than pay them off. Yeah. Well, um, I think your memory is correct that, you know, if you read to The Economist, you know, around the time when China was getting accession to the WTO and things like this, that was the story, that there would be all these gains from trade and the U.S. manufacturing workers who lost their jobs, they, they would get some transfer payment, mm -hmm. some chunk of the gains in trade, and that, they, that would make them better off. And I remember thinking at the time, like, but I don't think this is going to happen because <laughs> the, the, the wealthy people, these financiers, the highly paid service workers, they're not going to give up their gains from trade. They're going to say like, I worked hard. I'm super smart. That's why I'm such a highly paid lawyer. That's why I'm such a highly paid trader, mm. equity analyst. Why should I give it back to these guys in Ohio? And, and what mechanism, how would that actually work? Right? Like what politician who's getting most of their donations disproportionately from the super wealthy is going to take money from the super wealthy and give it to the guy in Ohio? Like, how is this actually going to work? And lo and behold, it didn't work. So, so there weren't actually, now there were gains from trade in the sense that the buying power of the guy in Ohio, like me as a kid in Iowa, I could buy more shoes now. That's uh, the that, only thing that kept the Ohio factory worker afloat is just cheaper goods. Right. And debt. And debt. Right. And the other problem, and the other problem that I sort of anticipated was in terms of human capital, a lot of these people who were factory workers were not going to become, even if we had set up training programs, reskilling programs, scholarships, to turn factory workers into computer programmers, I wasn't really confident that was ever going to work. And in fact, what we, we never really went down that route uh, at all. So now we have kind of a delayed effect where you do have these former blue collar workers, red state people who do want, you know, hey, where are my gains from the trade? Why didn't you give them to me? I guess I'm going to vote for Donald Trump because he's the only one who even admits that my situation needs rectifying. The other people just want to call me names when I complain about the consequences of, you know, this rise of China and, you know, we didn't get the gains from trade. So, so, so to me, it's like, you don't get your goodies in our U.S. political system until you marshal political power and mm -hmm. take it. Mm -hmm. And the system is set up at, at, at right now, and much more so than when I was young, so that money has the power. And so if you're, you know, blue collar working class people in the Midwest, you, you don't have a lot of power to demand your share of the pie. Um, and, but we are at that point where there is a fight now where those people sort of maybe without fully grasping this complicated picture that we've been describing kind of sense that they, they should be getting, and this would be true in Europe too, right? Lots Definitely. of working class people in Europe. So they kind of like gilets jaunes and stuff like this, they kind of sense like they, they haven't gotten theirs. The rich have gotten richer, we haven't gotten ours, and they're trying to like basically work through the political system to get this to work. But I don't think, I think they're going to be denied. It's, and, uh, yeah. I mean, if you just have to think through it, let's, let's think through it much better than paying them off, you know, 20 years ago. And it becomes a, a bit tragic because if you think through it, that means you've got to reverse this trade. You have to reverse this trade where everything's manufactured in Asia and then you're selling U.S. assets to pay for this stuff. And that means at some point, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So what's got to give? I don't know, but one is asset prices will be in trouble. That's one way to do it. If you suddenly say no more, you know, foreign buyers can't buy U.S. assets, that's one of the pettis ideas or to tax uh, foreign capital inflows. You, other thing that could suffer is if you really needed people, if you need, really needed to switch the economy from finance to manufacturing, well, your you know, $400,000 investment banking job now has to be a $150,000 engineering job. 
and your, you know, your lawyers and your consultants, and your marketing manager, your real estate agents who were quite comfortable on this trade, you know, well now have to be factory foremen and machinists and welders, which is a great decent living, but it's not what it was. Yeah. I, I just want to, I do want to talk about the challenges that America faces if it wants to reindustrialize. I do want to make a slight uh, clarification here, which is that there are two separate things. One is reversing globalization. The other one is continuing with globalization, but taking the gains from globalization and making sure they're redistributed in a somewhat more fair manner. And yes, yeah, those are different. Yeah, they're different yeah. things. And, and, and we didn't yeah. do, we yeah. talked about doing the latter, but we didn't do it. Yeah. And to me, the rise of MAGA and Trump, mm. you know, aside from immigration, which is another issue, is at least in part due to the fact that we didn't actually execute on redistributing the gains from trade. And I, I was always skeptical that there was any realistic, within the political economy, that there was any reasonable way, that plausible way that this was actually gonna happen. So I if it did happen, would those people have been happy just to receive a payoff check? Absolutely, okay, so, so it's... <laughs> right. So your, there's another neglected aspect of this, which is that your sense of well-being and pride in the meaning of life, you know, a lot of that's tied into your work. Mm -hmm. And so being a machinist who's happy with their skills and machining and likes to make things, you can't fully compensate that just with a check. Mm -hmm. So now the guy's unemployed or the guy works uh, behind a counter selling stuff at Kmart, right, at, at, uh, at the, the convenience store, but he gets a check that raises his income back to what he made as a welder. It doesn't fully restore right. the sense of well-being right. of that person. So that, that also was neglected, I think, in this discussion. But getting back to actually reversing globalization. So that would mean reshoring manufacturing to the US, somehow preventing these inexpensive goods from you know, being imported from China. I'm not saying that's impossible to do that, but it requires a huge amount of national will and coordination and competence to do it. And, and so for me, I, I would bet against the US being able to do this, even though I would like to see the U.S. capable of doing this? I just don't think it's going to happen. There is one kind of a, a kind of a fantasy fair lunch, free lunch. The fantasy free lunch is what a lot of people are you know, hoping for, like especially Silicon Valley people, where the U.S. technologically advances to some great degree where there is manufacturing and it's all wonder products that can't be made anywhere else. For example, you know, every company becomes, Elon Musk founds 500 companies and they're all as successful as Tesla and SpaceX. Then you've got your free lunch. But beyond that, you have a problem of, of having your cake and eating it too. Yeah, I, I think that fantasy world is very implausible and However, a lot of word cells, so to, I always use the word word cell. It means someone who's not very quantitative, maybe verbally extremely strong, but not very quantitative. And those people can fool themselves with lots of sort of uh, sloppy reasoning and such. And so there was a period of time where we just kept telling ourselves, and actually there are plenty of people who still believe this, America is exceptional. The American entrepreneur is so clever. American technologists are so creative that we'll always just stay ahead of these Chinese. These Chinese are just copying us. So by definition, they have to stay behind because they're just gonna be copying what we do. And we'll always just stay ahead of them. And there'll always be these great jobs for Americans to do, inventing the new, really good, innovative stuff. And that's how we'll stay ahead of these Chinese. And, and I think a lot of people still believe this. That certainly was a reassuring story that people could tell themselves. But I think the more you look at key sectors, whether it's robotics or AI or drones or EVs or solar panels or batteries, I could go on and on. You, you see the gap is closing. There, there isn't a constant gap where the U.S. just stays ahead. And no, so we'll I don't think there's a gap at all, but it's just yeah. every country, both U.S. and China, has its own things that are it's ahead on. There are absolutely things the U.S. is ahead on, but not but quite I, enough. Not, well, but I, I would say if you look at the last 20 years, mm. The, the set of things where, China, for the US, where the U.S. has a big advantage, like the U.S. has some special know-how and can create a big value add that the Chinese can't do, 
I think that's almost gone now. And so, so it used to be in across many sectors, mm. the Chinese government would say, hey, let's do this joint venture because we don't know how to make internal combustion engines. Let's give GM and Volkswagen really sweetheart deals. They're gonna have access to the markets here. We're gonna give them free land or tax breaks to build the factory here, but we'll gain because we'll learn from that. And eventually the Chinese will master this technology and we'll have our own national champions that can compete in the auto industry, right? I think that was the playbook. The thing is that it actually worked for the Chinese. So they did close the gap. So like in almost everything, like I was just noticing at breakfast at the hotel, there's this really nice automatic espresso making machine, coffee machine. It works great. It, it makes an excellent coffee. And I, I looked at it, you know, my wife said something like, oh, I wonder if it's made, is this an Italian machine or something? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, probably not. Mm -hmm. So then I just looked at it, I photographed it, and then I just did a search and I realized like, yes, this is made in China. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a big difference, which is that in almost every vertical, you find the Chinese have closed the gap. And so then now it becomes untenable for the Americans because the Americans really have to react to this. By the way, one thing I should say to give people, you know, we're, we're having a kind of dry, like wonky conversation, the kind of conversation like, you know, bankers or economists would have. To give a little bit of local color, which I think would be surprising to most Americans, is if you come to China and you like, just look at the aesthetic quality of things, like the, the, the printing on the restaurant menu or the logo in front of the boba tea shop or the, you know, the bedding on my hotel room bed, the, the, the aesthetic quality is now very high. And these things are designed here. It's not like, oh, we have to bring someone from New York or Paris to design this in China so it'll be cool and hip and nice looking. No, there's some person who went to a fashion design school or a design school in China who designed it now. And I think that's totally underappreciated because if you came here 20 years ago or you're used to like only looking at Timu and seeing kind of shitty knockoff stuff, you don't realize that the, the, the high level stuff in China is like the high level stuff in Tokyo or Seoul mm -hmm. now at a very high level to the point where someone who grew up here, who lives in say Shanghai and travels to Paris, might not be that impressed it's, by the uh, yeah go ahead it's even where the high level stuff because there's this thing in china called jue, of which is to over compete the high level stuff is now available to you know medium income people so you can go to these boutique hotels that you know you would pay an arm and a leg for overseas and you're just middle just middle class stuff here so I was just talking to a friend yesterday saying how China has quote unquote ruined a lot of fun in a lot of things as in caviar used to be this, this luxury item, but Chinese caviar, you can almost spread it on your toast every day. Audio file equipment, China has slashed the price of that stuff where it used to be, you know, you, you, you saved up all your money to buy a uh, set of headphones. And now Chinese audiophile headphones are, you know, totally affordable. Cars, for instance, I mean, if you look at the the, the Xiaomi SU7 Ultra that they're just coming out, why would anybody buy a Porsche or Ferrari? I, I, or... So I believe that car that you're describing is the one that the CEO of Ford has been driving around, right? The, this is a big story. Yeah, go ahead. CEO of Ford drove the normal Xiaomi, the Xiaomi I thought was the SU7. Yeah, SU7. Yeah just came out that they're going to launch in next month is it su7 ultra oh ultra okay got the it. ultra has 1500 horsepower yeah it's going to cost about 60 to seventy thousand us dollars yeah so it's pretty much xiaomi telling all of the you know the supercar manufacturers of the world that yeah, you're irrelevant now yeah but let me let me expand on this a little bit so mm -hmm. so the is his name jim farley mm -hmm. the ceo of ford who's a car guy mm -hmm. okay I mean, he's, he loves cars, he races cars, he's really into cars. I mean, you know, not surprising for the CEO of Ford, but not all CEOs, right, of, mm -hmm. even of an automaker are really, quote, car guys, but he is a car guy. And he, there was this big story in the Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago where he and some Ford team members came to China to look at the new EVs and tested them, and they were shocked. And they actually took several of the cars, shipped them back to the U.S., and put them in the headquarter building, headquarters building at Ford in Detroit. So if you go in there, 
first thing you see is a Chinese car. Mm -hmm. Now, why did they do that? So every Ford employee would realize this is an existential threat to Ford in Farley's own words. And the, the story that broke just recently is Par Farley was doing an interview with some podcasts and he just mentioned that he has been driving an SU7, a Xiaomi SU7 that they brought back and he doesn't want to give it up because he thinks it's such a great car. And so again, like a lot of people in America still want to say like, oh, there are these cheap cars from China. And even like Bloomberg or some European news agency talking about some tariffs or trade wars would say like cheap cars from China are a threat to Volkswagen. Well, if you ask the CEO of Ford, he's not talking about it as a cheap car. He's talking about it as a car that outperforms any sports car that he can get. Okay. It's electric vehicle. And maybe equally shocking is Xiaomi is best known as a company that makes cell phones and electronic gadgets. So the fact that they're able to build a car that's so awesome, it competes with, you know, the most expensive supercars in the world. Uh, you know, you should take note of that. Like, how were they able to do this? Right. Uh, go, uh, go. Tell, uh, tell a story. And this is yeah. a, a 20, 30 year old story, which may tell you why things are happening the way they happened. I went to undergrad as a car nut, a total car nut. I read Iacocca when I was in junior high school. I could identify every car on the road just by looking at the taillights. I can talk about the engine displacement, the horsepower, where it was manufactured. That's all I ever wanted to do was to be an auto engineer. And then when we signed up for all our internship interviews, I just signed up for the car companies. And then I got, I, I, I got offers from all of them because they were just so impressed. I was so enthusiastic. And when all the yeah. interns were posted, I saw one name on there and next to the name was Goldman Sachs. And I just asked around, what the heck is Goldman Sachs? And then somebody must have said investment bank, but in my head, I was like, what, an engineer working at a bank? Who is this guy, uh, is this guy dense or something? Well, during graduation, this guy carried the flag, which meant he had the highest GPA in all of engineering. And so a little wheel started turning my head and I kind of found out, and this is how wrongly America has had been set up in the past 30 years. When I did work at GM during my internships, I suddenly realized that, oh, these are day school kids. You know, I'll be, I have to rib you because yeah, Cornell state <laughs> school of the Correct. Keep talking, keep Correct. talking. And then, um, <laughs> but anyway, so that's just, apologies then, go big red. <laughs> But that's kind of what has happened in U.S. talent, where the talent has gone to finance, the talent has gone to Silicon Valley, but these old line manufacturing companies like General Motors and Ford, well, they get the pickings after Goldman Sachs, Google, Meta, you know, go through the 500,000 people. Whereas in China, they're graduating, um, how many engineers? I don't know, a couple million, three and a half million. Uh, so about, no, about, about three and a half million. About yeah, 10 yeah, million yeah. students in China graduate yeah. from college right yeah. now every year. Yeah. And it's plausible a third of them are effectively kind of engineering grads, yeah. right? So, yeah. And the government has been, rightly or wrongly, slapping around the finance industry in China, trying to lower their social status. And there's a lot of people in the finance who are quite upset about that. But I think this is a, a, you know, a purposeful calculation that we only have so much human resources available. Let's make sure they go to the correct places. Well, what, when I was young and America had values, core values, you had to be a little bit apologetic about going into finance because, because most people would say, uh, why are you going to finance? Like, do you think that helps people? Is it noble? Like it, like if you build a really great car, you can take some satisfaction in that if you, you know, solve some problem in chemistry that makes people's lives better, you can take some pride in that people in the past, when I was young, when I graduated from college, if you said you were going to finance, people would say, well, why are you just some greedy guy? Is that, it was like money, the most important thing to you. So you, you would have to overcome some mm -hmm. kind of social derision mm -hmm. over being a money guy. You just gave and, away your age, but. <laughs> well, no, I'm talking about, yeah. So yeah. This, is, this, is, this has changed yep. a lot in America, but I think 
an empire or a civilization that's on the rise valorizes real achievement. But when you get into the looting and grifting stage, everyone is like, oh, let me just get mine. What's the fastest way to get mine? Oh, I want to make partner at Goldman. See, that kid who carried the flag, maybe his dad or somebody told him, like, this is the way, if you want to make five, 10 million bucks in net worth by the time you're 40, oh, you can't do that as an engineer, but you can do it at Goldman. Oh, he was a New York City kid. That's Yeah, that's, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, but I don't think it's healthy. And I think the Chinese Communist Party now understands this. It's not that healthy to have that become the predominant view in your society because then you you don't have people who are willing to sacrifice for the common good like like the the, the idea that it is noble to be an engineer that makes real products or to be a scientist that discovers new things or to be a soldier that risks death for the people at home the reason those are attractive is because of good core values that valorize sacrifice in the name of something higher, something better, something for the collective good. And finance is not that. So, so of course, if you go to HBS or you go to these places, they'll tell you stories like, oh, but you're organizing capital, you're, you're allocating capital more efficiently and everyone benefits from that. And there is a kernel of truth in that statement, but I don't think it's good for, for a society to basically buy that line too much and have all of its best people try to go into finance. I think that society is going to get out competed by another healthier society, which is at an earlier stage of empire and still wanting to do real constructive things in the world. Yeah, I think China nipped it in the bud. I My career was made in China during the go-go time. The go-go time is pretty much Jiang Zemin through Hu Jintao. And that was you know, everything went, finance was huge, and it really needed a correction. And the Xi Jinping correction came through. And, you know, am I a fan of Xi Jinping? Well, I am a, um, he better know what he's doing, and I'm willing to hang on to see whether it all works out. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he he's moving things in a certain direction, high quality growth, advanced manufacturing, high technology. That's where he wants the economy to go. Less, I think the infrastructure thing, they've kind of figured out we did enough. We have the roads and the trains and the electrical systems that we need. So, so obviously we don't want to, a la Michael Pettis, invest, over invest in that now, maybe diminishing returns. But property for property's sake is just a speculative thing. Clearly that shouldn't be the way that the economy continues to grow. So he has a, a definite view. He's not just letting, quote, the market decide. Right what happens. They have a definite view for how they want their economy to develop. Time will tell whether yeah. it works out for them. I still give him an incomplete as a grade, but you know, certainly not a failure, which a lot of people have already given him or just assume it's a failure from the get go. Yeah. Now, now you mentioned Xi Jinping. We're, we're just about at an hour mark, so maybe we can start wrapping up a little bit. You mentioned Xi Jinping and, you know, I think a lot of people in the West would say like, pre or, or analysts of China would say pre Xi Jinping, it was a bunch of liberalizing folks, maybe from the Shanghai clique that were running the country prior to Xi mm. ascending to power. And that the liberalizing trends stopped and went into reverse. Mm. And the view from outside is that individual Chinese have less freedom to express themselves online. There's more sort of political indoctrination in the school curriculum. Yeah, you know, there's a bunch of things that have moved in a kind of anti-liberal or illiberal direction mm -hmm. under Xi. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of how that went and how realistic that assessment is? There's a kernel of truth to all of that. Yeah. And that has definitely happened. Yeah. Uh, now, there is an understanding that it needed to have all of that mm -hmm. as part of the backdrop to everything that has been going on from the anti-corruption investigation to understanding that the U.S. is now pushing back against China. Yeah. That is just one piece of the policy that you know needs to be in place as China moves forward. So, you know, the, the cliche is, you know, the, you know, the West swings from left to right, left to right, whereas China swings from opening and closing and opening and closing. 
So we are now at a closing phase. I suspect that if China comes through to the other side, where it feels more secure in its region, its economy has passed through this change where it goes from a property area and infrastructure investment driven to a you know high-tech manufacturing driven economy, then it will start listening again. That's the swing that China goes through. Yeah, I I think that for people who over extrapolate Xi, now they, I could be wrong. So she could turn into another bad emperor you know, with Maoist tendencies or something, you know, some really disastrous thing could happen. But I think people tend to over extrapolate because if, if there is this pendulum that swings back and forth, it could be that 10 or 20 years from now, we have another liberalizing go-go phase for China, where, as you said, it's feeling somewhat geopolitically secure, like mm -hmm. it's built up its military, it's caught up technologically, there are no real existential threats to the country. There's no way for the Americans to try to like destroy the whole economy here by cutting off all the microchips or something like this. Yeah, then we could suddenly go through a phase which was kind of like what we went through, say, in the 2010s or early 2000s in China. And, and people then would just be wondering, like, what were they talking about? What were people writing about in 2024 when they were saying, oh, she's going to turn this into some kind of Stalinist state, right? So I, th I think it's, it's too early to judge, you know, what things will be like in, say, 10 years in China. Great. So maybe you want to end it there? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. It was great having you on the show. Yeah. Thank you and for having me on. Everyone read Han Feitza's column in Asia Times. And I generally recommend Asia Times because, uh, as you know, I've had David Goldman as a guest uh, on the show. And, um, you know, he's got a very unique and insightful take on China. And I think Asia Times is somewhat unique in, you know, its coverage. It's quite different from the usual mainstream sources for coverage of Asia and China. All right. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone.